Ora bem, vamos começar. É um prazer enorme, enorme, enorme estar aqui hoje. Eu imagino que a Sofia esteja na Holanda, certo? Certo. Está na Holanda. Eu, nós, eu, hoje é um dia de seminário, de seminário de cultura material, da ciência, e é um prazer enorme hoje estar com a Sofia Lovegrove Pereira, que trabalha na Holanda, ou como se diz agora, Países Baixos, <risos> Agência de Património Cultural dos Países Baixos, Research Center for Material Culture, ela trabalha lá, e é onde é coordenadora assistente do programa International Heritage Corporation e é investigadora associada do Research Center for Material Culture. Os seus principais interesses de investigação estão relacionados com as afterlives do colonialismo no presente, isto é, os resquícios materiais, bem como as práticas e as epistemologias formuladas durante o período, durante e devido ao período imperial, colonial e a forma como estas perduram no presente. Foca sobretudo no contexto português, mas também investiga as suas ligações ao contexto colonial holandês. E ela já nos vai falar uh, sobre um estudo que fez sobre o Jardim Botânico Tropical, em Belém, que hoje pertence à Universidade de Lisboa, e é por aí talvez que eu começava. Uh, temos um gato a passar pelo <risos> ecrã, que é sempre uma Capaz coisa gira. Como é, que se chama? Como é que se chama o gato? Nusa. Nusa? Hum. <risos> Sim. Ok, Nusa, agora deixa-nos em paz. Ah, um bocadinho. Sim, sim. Ah, mas, uh, Sofia, muito obrigada por ter aceito este nosso convite. Eu já tinha ouvido falar muito de si, portanto estou entusiasmadíssima de estar aqui consigo, conhecê-la pessoalmente, nós não nos conhecíamos, apenas, apenas por e-mail, ah, mas uh, li os seus textos, li os seus estudos e tenho uma curiosidade enorme para ouvir apresentar. Portanto, isto começa com uma tese de mestrado, não é? O interesse pelo Jardim Botânico Trop Tropical de Belém. É isso, conte-nos lá. E faça também Sim. uma apresentação um bocadinho menos institucional do que a minha, quer dizer. O que é que a motiva? O que é que a interessou? Uh, como é que entra por estas áreas? Uh, e o que é que tem feito depois do mestrado, o que é que fez, etc. Conte-nos lá um bocadinho. Uh, pois, isso, o meu mestrado é, que se chama Heritage and Memory Studies, foi feito na Universidade de Amsterdão, que acabei no final do ano passado. Uh, foi o meu segundo mestrado, o meu primeiro foi em Arqueologia Histórica, portanto, este fascínio, digamos, pela cultura material já, já está em mim há bastante tempo. Este foi um segundo mestrado, porque, de facto, aquilo que me interessa... Uh, talvez ainda mais do que os objetos, são as narrativas que se colocam em cima dos objetos, claro, não é? Que fazer... claro. Um, e o passado colonial, bom, eu não sei, eu não sei exatamente quando é que esse, esse interesse começou, mas acho que talvez um pouco porque também quando mudei para a Holanda, ou para os Países uhum. Baixos, uh, onde... Quando é que mudou? Quando é que mudou há muito tempo? Cerca de seis anos. Ah. Cerca de seis anos, sim. Já fala holandês ou não? Falo, sim. Não, falo. não de todo fluente, mas sim. Mas falo, falo um pouco, sim. Falo. E percebe ah. na rua, não é? Sim, 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 sim. E dá jeito, apesar de... Eu vivo em Amsterdão, onde as pessoas falam bem, bem inglês, mas... Falam é lindamente bom inglês fazer... todas. Sim, é. mas é sempre bom. Aliás, isso é um problema destes países, não é? Que a gente quer aprender a língua e não consegue. Pois. Desde o empregado de mesa até o motorista de... do autocarro, toda a gente fala lindamente inglês. É verdade, é verdade. É, até nas, nas aldeias igual. mais recôndidas. Não? Mais recôndidas é. falam inglês, conversam connosco é em inglês. Verdade. A gente quer aprender holandês e não, não consegue. Mas conte-nos lá, então, e portanto, muda-se para lá, e, e depois nessa altura também, é nessa altura que se interessa pelas questões, digamos, pela questão colonial, não é? Sim, uh, acho que, acho que talvez Na relação estar, com a cultura sim, material. Sim, uhum. acho que talvez por estar cá, onde, o, uh, o, digamos que em termos do discurso público, há mais, as discussões sobre o passado colonial são ainda mais uh, presentes, quer dizer, eu também mudei para cá há seis anos atrás, não é? Eu acho que pois. em Portugal as coisas começaram a ficar mais uh, visíveis, digamos, o discurso público ficou mais visível, talvez desde 2017, 18, talvez, quando houve também a questão do, do memorial às vítimas da escravatura, da jazz, claro, uh, claro. a questão daquela ideia de criar um museu uh, dos descobrimentos e tudo mais, quer dizer, não é que estas pois. pessoas Foi esse debate, anos. no fundo, que desencadeou, não é? Mas embora as Sim, discussões já, já tivessem... existiam, exato, yeah. uh, e se calhar em núcleos mais Mas pequenos. estavam mais fora da esfera pública, não lhe parece? É isso, então, pois, é é isso. acho que é isso, acho que é isso. E aqui as coisas já têm estado, acho que o diálogo tem existido há mais tempo também com, com comunidades uh, de, de antigas uh, descendentes de, de pessoas de antigas uhum. colónias holandesas e, e aqui há um, há, um, há um momento do ano que é sempre muito, muito complicado que é, é uh, em novembro que é o, a, a celebração do Santa Claus o, e o Zwarte Piet, o Black Piet ah, que, sim, é, que é uma sim, tradição claro, pronto, é que eles pintam polêmica. a cara de preto e, e é, uhum. é muito, muito polémica e essa discussão acho que eu comecei a, a deparar-me com ela acho no primeiro ano em que estava cá 
e, e, e comecei a interrogar-me também sobre narrativas que nós temos também em Portugal e que nunca, ou que muito, sendo uma pessoa branca, não é? Portuguesa, que não, se calhar não tem ligações ao passado comunal, direta, uhum, mas diretamente, uhum. ou se calhar, aliás, eu acho que eu tenho vindo a descobrir que até tenho, mas que não são muito faladas na família, ah, estas questões têm Ai, que falar as questões. É giro, isso é giro. Muito bem, e então, e depois fez a proposta, e porquê um jardim botânico tropical, Belém? Ah, porque eu tinha lido um artigo, eu gosto, eu, eu gosto dos espaços, jardins botânicos em geral, eu gosto, são espaços que me interessam, ah, e eu acho que também, porque tinha lido um artigo, ah, eu comecei por, por também ficar muito na, na zona de Belém, e todo o padrão dos descobrimentos, daqueles claro. monumentos muito, cada vez mais polémicos. É carga, não é? <risos> sim, a, sim. a bagagem é mais evidente, não é, do sim. ponto de vista... Uhum. E depois estava a ler um artigo uh, de, uma, de uma académica americana chamada Ellen Sapiga e ela escreveu um artigo sobre, precisamente, sobre, ela foca-se muito no contexto português, e ela escreveu um artigo sobre o contexto de Belém, um, um espaço de memória colonial, né, ou imperialista, uhum. e ela depois acaba o artigo a falar sobre os bustos no Jardim Botânico. Uhum. E pensei, uhum. uau, ok, nunca... nunca sei, qual é, sei qual é o texto dela. Sim, sim. Uh, então fui logo visitar, quando tive a oportunidade, uhum. e, e de facto fiquei espantada por não... E na altura em que eu visitei o Jardim, já foi em 2008, uhum. Foi na altura a primeira vez que eu visitei desde há muitos anos, não é? Que já tinha ido em criança, provavelmente. Claro. Uh, mas, uh, de facto, não Era um jardim um bocado escondido, não era? Era um jardim é. um bocado escondido. É. Porque é. fica ali por trás dos pastéis de Belém, é preciso a gente saber que aquilo Exato. existe, porque não se percebe bem se é privado, se não é privado, não é? E, pois. E, e portanto, Sim. é um jardim, não é como outros jardins de Lisboa, não é? Inclusivamente aqui Sim. o nosso Jardim Botânico de Lisboa, aqui no Príncipe Real, que as pessoas sabem que existe. Sim. Uh, mas esse, o jardim do ultramar, como dizem os taxistas, não é? Quando Sim. a gente vai de táxi, eles dizem, ah, é para o jardim do ultramar, quer ir. Sim, tem que muito, não, é? exato. Pois é, pois é, como ele teve tantos nomes, não é? Ao pois. longo do tempo. Uh, exato. Mas pronto, e então e começou, e estudou, e, e, quer dizer, e, e defendeu recentemente, não foi, Sofia? Uh, sim, quer dizer, eles aqui na Holanda nem sempre é necessário defender a tese. Eu sei, quer dizer, depende um bocado das universidades e das tradições das várias universidades, mas de facto acabei uh, no final do ano passado e recebi, digamos, o diploma há pouco tempo, que isso também uhum. demora muito tempo e com, com o Covid as coisas estão demorar também mais tempo. Pois é. Uh, mas, e pronto, e foquei-me de facto no Jardim uh, Portânico Tropical, mas também no Tarrafal, em Cabo Verde, que eu queria olhar para dois espaços completamente diferentes, né? que um é, é uma prisão, ou uma ex-prisão, claro, um espaço claro, que é... Claro. Obviamente um espaço um bocado violento, ou que, que atrai, uhum. ou que, que pronto, está associado a memórias de, 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 de violência. Pois, e, pois, pois, pois. E, então, é mais muito, saliente, não é? É mais, é mais óbvio, sim, nas, é, nas próprias é. estruturas é. materiais. Enquanto isso, o Jardim Botânico é um espaço que muito facilmente nem sequer... A gente nem sequer associa, Exato, é que nem sequer uma pessoa associa a, a história em geral. Muito Se não menos formos um nós, não é? Se não formos sim. nós a levantar aquela estratigrafia exato. toda, que é muito complicada, de facto. Pois. Eu gosto imenso daquele jardim, vou-lhe dizer, adoro, porque é um jardim muito complexo, não é? Porque tem aquela... Sim. Era uma quinta renascentista, privada, também com uma história de suprimento associada uhum. bem, ainda antes... Sim. Uh, ainda antes de ser jardim colonial, depois toda aquela questão da formação dos agrónomos também lhe dá uma camada diferente, depois a, a, a exposição do mundo português dá outra Sim. camada Ou mais diferente, uma camada. É? Sim. Exato. e portanto tudo aquilo é um palimpsesto incrível e, e nós estamos a estimular muito na Universidade de Lisboa os estudos Uh, quer dizer, já, já houve estudos, não é? uhum. mas uh, estamos a estimular estudos nestas novas perspectivas de Sim. cruzamentos não é? de, 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 de áreas à luz das questões que preocupam, no fundo, a sociedade portuguesa contemporânea. E, portanto, uhum. o, o, seu, o seu... Eu acho que começou a fazer a tese, ainda não era o Jardim da Universidade de Lisboa, ou era? Uh, acho, que já, acho que já era, sim. Já uh, era. Mas foi, eu comecei uhum. a escrever a tese, uh, a primeira, porque eu também escrevi um, um pequeno trabalho para uma pequena cadeira, no início do mestrado, em que eu, e foi baseado naquilo que eu vi no Jardim 2018. E, portanto, isso foi uhum. antes de haver qualquer referência ao passado colonial. Fechou, uh, aliás. E foi, depois fechou. fechou exatamente. em 2018. Exatamente. Sim. E depois teve obras de recuperação, pois. mais de infraestruturas, e estava, estava um bocado... Uh, há muito, nunca tinha sido restaurado, na realidade. E ainda está em curso, Sim. porque a gente ainda vai recuperar a estufa e uma série de coisas, de infraestruturas lá. Sim. Mas, uh, mas não havia sequer tabelas, não é? Legendas pois, relativamente, exato. por exemplo, aos bustos e relativamente à ilha. Sim. Não é? Aquela Sim. ilha Sim. muito uh, problemática, não é? Do ponto exato. de vista do passado. Da, da... Porque o jardim foi todo redesenhado, aliás, para começar. Bem, vamos, vamos à sua... <risos> Vamos agora à sua apresentação, chega, eu ficava aqui horas, não consigo. 
mas uh, vamos primeiro à sua apresentação. Entretanto, convido toda a gente que está a ver agora no YouTube, no canal do Museu Nacional de História Natural e da Ciência, se quiserem deixar questões para a Sofia, uh, podem deixar no chat ao lado e nós vamos lá apanhá-las todas. Uh, e, e ela vai responder no final. Mas para já vai fazer a sua apresentação, que estou uh, muito ansiosa também por ver. Faça favor, Sofia. E eu, eu não sei se devia ter uh, dito antes que nós vamos fazer em inglês, não é? Portanto, a minha apresentação agora vai passar para o inglês. Espero que ah, não haja okay. problema. Não, só o Instagram está em inglês. Sim, yes. Yeah, okay, that's be, fine. Be great. As long as it's not Dutch. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> And first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Marta Lourenço uh, for inviting me to to be part of this conversation. Also, of course, uh, Ana Godinho and Marta Costa and Branca Moriesh, who have helped me in my research already for a couple of years now. And of course, I would like to thank everybody that is here uh, joining us today and that hopefully we'll have a lot of questions after uh, my presentation. Uh, so as we've been discussing already a bit in Portuguese that I've been, I'm going to be presenting a bit of the work I did in my uh, thesis for the Masters in Heritage and Memory Studies at the University of Amsterdam that I finished last year. And uh, as the title of the, the master's program already shows, uh, my thesis very much lies at the intersection of critical heritage and memory studies, because I explore the politics of collective memory at work in two national heritage sites. Um, and I basically examine how the uh, colonial past and colonial structures of power live on today in two countries, Portugal and Cape Verde, uh, by looking at the way in which this past is remembered today. Um, and to do this, I analyze the narratives produced at two heritage sites that are connected to the colonial past. Uh, one of these was the, uh, the former Tejafal prison in Cape Verde um, and uh, the Tropical Botanic Garden of Belém, which is in Portugal, which is what I'll be focusing my presentation on uh, today. And I will share my screen. I almost forgot I had a PowerPoint presentation. Ah. Uh, <laughs> you do, you do. Um, Uh, okay, yeah, share. And hopefully, you should be seeing it now. I'll just It's make perfect. it a bit bigger. And now, yes. Yeah, it's okay. absolutely gorgeous. Great. <laughs> well, it's a very good, a very photogenic uh, space, I must say. So it's quite easy to take nice photographs. Uh, just a, a little uh, sort of table of contents of, of my presentation uh, today. I'll start by saying something a little bit about the, the, the theory and methodology that I followed in my thesis. And uh, for those that are not very familiar with the Portuguese context, I'm not exactly sure who is following today. I will quickly say something about uh, Portugal's uh, relationship to its colonial past uh, today. And then I will go into my case study and will share some of the main arguments that I developed uh, in my thesis. So I'll start by saying something about this, this idea of colonial afterlives, which uh, really uh, was kind of the, the, um, uh, the sort of Yeah, it kind of went through my whole thesis. It was the central topic of my thesis. Uh, and to think about this, this, this concept, I drew on the work of, of several scholars like Anne Stoller and uh, Walter Mignolu. And I use, I use it in my thesis to, to think and to work through, uh, and to focus on two kind of interconnected things. Uh, on the one hand, the ways in which the past uh, is still alive today or, or is brought back to life today through heritage and mem collective memory practices. I'm thinking, for instance, of the, the conservation of, of historical buildings or uh, the musealization of objects. And on the other hand, I use, also use the term afterlives to refer to the way the colonial past and colonial power structures that were created during and through imperialism and colonialism continue to inform ways we understand and represent our world uh, and the ways we produce knowledge about our world today. And these ideas are very much uh, influenced by what has been called a decolonial option. This is a movement that originated in Latin America that uh, is quite critical, or it's very critical of the, the self-proclaimed universality and superiority of Western knowledge and, and civilization. Um, but to go back to my thesis, uh, essentially I explored uh, what kinds of knowledges are being produced in the way the botanical garden is being presented to the public and by reflecting on what this might mean today in societal terms. And I'll quickly say something about the, the well, this, I mean, I'm not going to go too deep into the methodology because that would be a bit too boring, but uh, I basically examined the narratives, as I said, uh, that are being produced in the garden. And I focus mainly on the official narratives, which is basically the narratives that are produced by those who are managing the sites, in this case, the University of Lisbon, and more specifically, the Museum of Natural History and Science. Um, and uh, I looked at uh, a text and images uh, that I, I found in the garden. Then I tried to answer questions like what is being shown, what is being told, 
uh, who is doing that telling and uh, for whom is that telling being done? And uh, I also very much see uh, a narrative as a form of representation, which means that in showing and telling things about the world around us, uh, through certain objects, we are creating and circulating meaning about the world around us. And, uh, okay, yes, I'll just say very quickly a couple of words about uh, sort of contemporary narratives about the colonial past. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, Portugal has a really long history uh, uh, of, of imperialism and colonialism that started in the 15th century and lasted at least until uh, 1975, if we are not uh, counting Macau as well. And uh, uh, today, I would say that the kind of dominant official narrative is probably that of Portugal as a maritime nature, a nation uh, that pioneered the so-called voyages of discoveries in the uh, 15th and 16th centuries. And this narrative became especially uh, of very strong, especially during Portugal's far-right dictatorship in the 20th century that lasted until 1974. And during this time, this narrative was also used very much as a kind of tool of propaganda to foster this kind of a sense of, of national identity and pride but also to legitimize the Portuguese presence in, uh, in its colonies, uh, especially its African colonies. But there are also, of course, other uh, less, maybe less visible narratives that I think are becoming more and more visible in Portugal. Uh, I think especially since the 1990s, uh, more, more activists, artists and scholars have been quite critical of the way Portugal and institutions deal with, uh, with the colonial past and how these histories are also connected to current problems like racial discrimination, for example. And I think that the image here on the on the right is uh, a, a, a kind of a, a, a drawing of what uh, the, the memorial to the victims of slavery uh, that is not yet built, but will be built, I think, soon uh, uh, will look like. And I think and this is a project of the Jazz Association of Afro-Descendants. And I think this is a perfect example of, of one of these sort of alternative or counter narratives that are uh, getting more and more space in Portugal. And uh, to go back to the Tropical Botanic Garden. Uh, as I said, it is located in Belém, which is a neighborhood in Lisbon. More specifically, it's located in the monumental area of Belém. And this is a, an area that is filled with monuments that were built at different times, uh, uh, many of them associated uh, with the discoveries. Um, and like the monument to the discoveries that was built during the dictatorship, and that's the image on the right lower uh, side of the, of the screen. It's a very, I think, possibly one of the most famous monuments in Lisbon, if not Portugal today. And... Um, so in the garden, uh, it exists for several centuries, um, but it has suffered lots of changes, of course. And uh, what you can still see today are some of the structures from the 17th century, like the Palace of Caleta, uh, also a lot of statues from the 18th century. Uh, but I focus on its uh, 20th century history, since a lot of what we can see today dates from this, this century. And I focus here specifically on two moments of this garden's uh, history, which are connected to the colonial past. Um, the first uh, moment, is between uh, 1912 and 1974, when this was the colonial garden of Lisbon. Uh, especially during, uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, botanical research and gardens were deeply connected to colonial politics because they, they played a very important role in the expansion and exploitation of empire. So first you had to, to know the space and then you would go and occupy and, and exploit the natural resources and other kinds of resources. Um, and plants were studied and collected and extracted and transported around the world, not just to know about them, uh, not only for aesthetic reasons, of course, that was also sometimes a motivation, but also for economic purposes. And this was also the case of the Tropical Botanic Garden, as it used, uh, was used to support botanical research in Portugal's then African colonies in the 20th century, and to produce and teach knowledge about the agricultural pot potential of the colonies, which was driven by the goal to exploit these spa spaces for economic purposes. Um, and of course, I mean, I, th I guess it's, it's worth mentioning that it, this exploitation of natural resources in the colonies was often... Uh, often tied to also uh, violence towards humans. I mean, I'm thinking, for instance, of slavery uh, uh, that was it, well, before slavery a bit later on, that was very much used to, uh, as the, 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 um, the working force behind this exploitation of the natural resources like sugar or rubber. And um, the second moment that I want to focus on is uh, the exhibition of the Portuguese world that lasted for a few months in 1940. Uh, this, this was a, a sort of a tool of, of imperial propaganda of the dictatorship, uh, the Estado Novo, uh, or New State. Uh, it occupied the whole uh, monumental era of Belém, the, so the images that I showed before. And it used many of the buildings that already existed, but it also created new buildings, like the Monument of the Discoveries that I also mentioned. Um, and this exhibition had different sections, and the one located inside the garden was called the Colonial Section. 
Uh, there, they, uh, the exhibition presented monuments and exhibitions about the colonies, including uh, exhibitions about the potential, uh, the economic potential of the, of the colonies in terms of natural resources. Uh, another, one of the central elements uh, of this, uh, the colonial section of the exhibition was what were called the indigenous villages. And um, uh, these were essentially reconstructed settlements uh, that were spread around the garden with around 138 individuals from the colonies. And they were used to show uh, to, to the Portuguese public, it was mainly a Portuguese audience, uh, uh, it, it seems, that visited the exhibition. So it's mainly to show the different ethnicities of the Portuguese dominions like Cape Verde, Angola, Mozambique. And this practice of exhibiting humans was uh, quite relatively common between the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, uh, when hundreds of, of these, what have been called ethnographic spectacles uh, were created in Europe, North America, and even colonized spaces. And they usually uh, had two interconnected goals. Uh, on the one hand, to develop scientific, uh, so-called scientific anthropological knowledge about the colonial subjects, but also to reinforce and normalize the idea of, of difference, of racial and cultural differences between the, the Europeans and the colonized, uh, or the to be colonized uh, peoples. And uh, of course, that these, these kind of, it's, I guess it's not necessary to say that these, these practices worked as we can see in uh, still ongoing ideas about racial uh, difference that are still ongoing in many countries today, like Portugal, but also the Netherlands where I live. And what is also important to mention here is that uh, Western practices of, of ordering and classifying the natural world, world uh, that were used uh, in botanical science or Western botanical science. And ideas about racial difference are very much historically uh, uh, connected. I won't go into too much detail here, but Carl Linnaeus, the famous 18th century botanist and taxonomist who formalized the binomial nomenclature, the system we still use today to, work, to name organisms, also worked on the classification of human forms, which was one of the 18th century roots of what would become in the 19th century scientific racism. Uh, but to also turn this around, racism was also uh, well, it was also used to justify the West and it's uh, the way that the West was also taking lands over from other people that was seen as racially inferior and incapable of taking care of it. So I just wanted to sort of highlight that these histories of ordering uh, the world and naming the world uh, between natural elements of the world, but also human elements was very much, uh, very much connected histories. But to return to the botanical garden, um, uh, as far as I know, this, uh, the, the site is not connected to slavery or forced labor, histories of slavery or forced labor, but I think that uh, more research is, is definitely necessary, I think, to understand in which kind of conditions the, the botanical research uh, uh, took place, um, and also to, to know a little bit more about this, the exhibition of 1940, because as far as I know, there's not that much information available about the individuals that were there, at least 138 individuals that were presented or exhibited in the garden. Um, yeah, so and to fast forward to 1974, that's when the dictatorship ended and most of the colonies were granted independence soon afterwards. And this garden then stopped being called the colonial garden. Uh, between 1940 and today, not much has changed in terms of the garden's physical characteristics. So I just want to say a little, a few words about what can still be seen in the garden today. Um, I think regarding the histories of botanical science uh, in colonial times, we have, of course, many, many plants uh, that were taken from different places around the world. And we also have the structures that supported this work, like the main uh, greenhouse that was built in 1914. I showed a photo of this uh, structure, this here on the left-hand side. Um, and although it was made to be temporary, the exhibition of 1940 still left quite a lot of structures in the garden. But I will show some of them now. See, I'm using here, this is the map that was used in the catalog of the exhibition, the, the sort of the, the brochure of the exhibition. So I show here some of these structures that still exist in the garden. This is the pavilion of raw materials. And there's also the, see, this is the colonial house with its tiles and these representations of peoples from the colonies or stereotypical representations. And then there are also 14 of these uh, busts that are spread around the garden, which very much a bit like the indigenous villages, they were meant to also show the different ethnicities of the colonies. And originally they were, so now they're spread around the garden, but originally they were uh, along one avenue, the Avenue of the Peoples of the Empire, I think it was called. Um, so, and I visited this garden several times over the past few years. Uh, until 2019 or 2018, the garden was in a pretty bad state of conservation. 
and no information was really presented about uh, the colonial histories of the garden. But in 2019, a big renovation project started. Um, and this was also related to an institutional change and also to the bad state of conservation of the garden because from 1974, the garden was part of the Institute of Tropical Scientific Research, uh, but this became extinct in 2015. And then the garden passed into the hands of the University of Lisbon, as I mentioned before, and is managed by the National Museum of Natural History and Science. And the first phase of this renovation project ended last year. And uh, now I believe that the second phase is still ongoing, uh, which I think uh, involves mainly the restoration of the, the different structures in the garden, like the colonial house. But I think, Dr. Marta, you can uh, probably say something more about this project. If <laughs> oh, I can't hear you. <laughs> Sure, we will discuss it a little bit. I'll, I can tell a little bit about it, for sure. Okay. Um, and so I visited this garden in the summer of 2020 uh, after the, a, big, a big part of the, the, the renovation project already has uh, had taken place. And I visited again last month when I was in Portugal. And uh, uh, what, what has taken place in the garden is pretty much uh, a, a pretty big narrative change, but also some continuities in terms of how the garden is now presented to the public. And I'm of course, I'm mentioning, I'm talking, focusing here on the, the colonial histories of the garden. So uh, in this renovation project, a lot of effort was put into telling more stories of the garden. Uh, one of the ways of doing this was to create a new signboard system and a mobile application. You can see these in the images. And uh, these, these, well, these tools, let's say, they pretty much work to highlight some of the elements in the garden, uh, some trees, some objects like the statues, and to present information about these elements and the garden more generally. Before the, the renovation project, there were already a few information boards, but they were mostly related to the different plants in the garden with the names of the plants and where they came from. So my analysis of the official narratives produced at the site involved examining what is said about the garden, uh, its different elements and its histories by looking at these different elements. I looked at the app, the mobile application, the new information plagues, but also information shared on social media. For example, uh, during the opening uh, of, the, of the garden, last, it ha happened last year, and there was a little video made of that. And um, also on official texts like, the, like on the website of the museum. So I'll focus here on some of the texts that I examined. Uh, those that I think are quite representative of, of let's say, the official narratives uh, produced at the site. Um, one thing that I noticed quite fast when I visited the garden was that uh, the garden is presented to the public in a binary way, let's say, in a dual way. Uh, on the one hand, you have the botanical elements, and on the other, the historical elements. And this can be seen on these big uh, plaques that have been put at the entrance of the garden. These are new since the renovation project. Um, and you can see that you have the, the botanical uh, circuits, and then you have the historical circuit of, or uh, uh, the Percurso Botanico, and then uh, the, the inclusive circuit. And that has more to do with, uh, if, I, if I understood correctly, it's areas of the garden that are accessible to people that have uh, uh, limitations. Yes, in terms accessibility, of accessibility uh -huh. with people with a low uh, access, uh, exactly. whether by deficiency and so on. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And, so what, what, what for me this already indicated was um, that the botanical elements of the garden are seen as separated from the historical elements of the garden because there's this clear separation between the botanical circuit and the, and the historical circuit. And um, uh, some, these, are, these are some of the texts that I, I'm including here, some of the texts that I think are quite representative uh, for the arguments that I'll make uh, uh, in a second. And, and, um, and these are texts that I talk that refer to the, the botanical elements of the garden. You see texts like remarkable botanical collection. This garden tells the story of Portugal and the Portuguese in the world. It's a place of high scientific uh, interest and see if I can read it. And <laughs> the prestige of the colonial garden led it to be invited to participate in national and international exhibitions. Some of the, oh, trying to share my screen. Yes. Um, some of the, the trees are highlighted uh, in the mobile application. Uh, there's this sort of section that says trees you must see, and I'm not sure. Is can you see my my uh, screen entirely, my presentation? Yes, it's okay. perfect, Sophia. Okay, go on, perfect. you can go on. Um, so some of the trees are highlighted, as I was saying, in the app. Uh, here's an example of a plant, the Afrocarpus mani, uh, that comes from Santomé, which was uh, used to be one of Portugal's colonies, and the kind of information we get from the app. Uh, but also the signboards related to the botanical circuit is mainly information from the standpoint of Western science. 
and its tradition of classifying and ordering the world. And this can be seen, for example, in the taxonomic information about this plant and other plants, and by mentioning uh, the European man who collected this specimen, which makes it seem like he almost would have discovered this, this, this plant and it works, which works to obliterate probably longer connections to this plant from other perspectives and cultures and contexts. Uh, the app also includes information about the uses of this and other plants. In this case, the app says, you can't see it here, but it's kind of below. It didn't fit uh, the screenshot that I made. Uh, in this case, the app says that this is a timber species which, uh, with its wood having high commercial value. And this is information that shows indirectly how a lot of botanical research was also driven by uh, economic motivations. But information about why and how this and other plants are presented in this garden are not uh, included. And the same goes for the signboards in the garden, which present similar information, often with less detail, because you can also use the QR code to get more information, as you can see in the photograph that I included here on the right. Let's see, yeah. Uh, about the historical circuits, this one is divided into different routes uh, in the mobile application. And most of the elements are related to the 20th century, but not all of them. And the exhibition of 1940, so the Portuguese exhibition, uh, the, the exhibition of the Portuguese world of 1940 is one of the main themes of, of uh, the mobile application when it comes to the historical elements. And this route very much directly addresses the colonial histories of the garden. Uh, and for example, it mentions how the main greenhouse was used to receive plants from, for, uh, from Portugal's former colonies. And it shares even more information about the colonial exhibition of 1940 and the colonial section. So I include here some examples of, of what you can now see in the garden. And this one is uh, an example of one of the new uh, information plaques that is standing next to the bus. Now, all, if, I, if I say correctly, I think that all of the pairs of busts in the garden now have a plaque next to it where you can find information about them, yes. as you can see here. Yes. Now they have labels. Yeah, and one other thing that I thought is quite interesting is that now the, all of these busts are now also, they have a, a catalog number and they're all included in the collection of the museum which I think is a very exactly. also important exactly. change, which shows that these, these objects are also seen as important. Yes, um, they're part of the collection and also the other sculptures, the 18th century, yeah. okay? So exactly. it's not only the, the busts. Yeah. Every item was, um, in a way, uh, it's not only the plants that are important, you know? It's also this historical, the fact that we created the historical routes uh, result actually from giving um, uh, value and meaning to all these objects that were dispersed. So now they're cataloged okay. and they're, uh, it's for the first time I think ever, because I think before they were considered more decoration, yeah. probably, yeah. Yeah, okay. and I think that's a pretty, quite important change that has taken place since the renovation project, I believe. Um, and uh, let's see, and also an, in a very, what I consider quite an important uh, change also is that uh, now on the location of uh, what is called the main island in the garden, which you can see sort of here in the photographs uh, and where one of the indigenous villages was set up, uh, there is now uh, a new information plate that talks about these exhibitions. And that is the first time that really uh, uh, specific, explicit information is, is, is mentioned about this, this uh, exhibition that took place there. And you see here, see, I include here the, the information plate. I'm not going to going to read the text, but essentially what it says, what it tells the visitor is that this was the formal location of one of the so-called indigenous villages created in 1940. Um, and it also uh, mentions that this was quite a, a violent practice at that time, that, that was relatively common at that time. Actually, 1940 was already when this practice was, let's say, was not really being done anymore. I think that uh, Belgium had an even later colonial exhibition like this one, but it was one of the last ones. That's um, very <laughs> important what you're saying. This is mm. one of the later stuff, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's, uh, of course, in the 1920s, uh, even the Natural History Museum in New York, the American Museum of Natural History had the, you know, the gallery of the human races, right? Yeah, yeah. But then that declined uh, very much. And so in the 1940s, we, we don't have this, we didn't have this kind of things anymore. So um, yeah. this kind of objectification, which is a word that you did not use, but I think it's really what it means. It's to objectify, Definitely. objectify humans Definitely. and, um, and remove them of all their dignity when they are on display. It's like objects, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah. and so that thing um, did not happen at this time uh, so much. You're right, you're right. Yeah. 
Um, thank you for the uh, for the comment. And um, so what I what I argued in my thesis was that what what is quite clear uh, from this kind of these new information plates about the exhibition of 1940 and this 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 exhibiting of, of humans, this objectification of humans, is that uh, the curators are really trying to address these these histories, these violent histories, in a in a critical way. And um, uh, this effort to tell these histories uh, related to the colonial past is uh, a very important change in relation to the narratives that were presented in the garden before the renovation project uh, took place, uh, which, as I said before, at, at that time, I think before the renovation project, there was really no information that you could find about uh, why these statues were there in the first place, where did they come from? Um, so I'm just going to, I'll say something quickly about sort of, Kind of my main conclusions, let's say, of, of my, my chapter about the botanical garden, my thesis. Uh, what I argued was that uh, the official narratives produced uh, uh, about and in this garden uh, and its colonial histories reveal a contrasting approach when we compare the natural history, uh, the natural elements of the garden, and the historical elements of the garden, or the cultural, human-related elements of the garden. And I argue that this had to do with with several factors. Uh, first of all, that uh, histories of botanical research in colonial times are very often overlooked uh, in many sites, not just this one, because plants are typically associated with politics, let alone with violent histories. In focusing only on the scientific side of plants from the Western, uh, Western perspective, uh, the official narrative implies that this garden is politically and socially neutral. Uh, but of course, science itself is also susceptible to politics. Uh, one just needs to think that botany as an academic discipline in the 18th and 19th century centuries existed mainly because knowledge about the properties of plants for economic and also medicinal purposes was important to European countries. And therefore there was a lot of investment also in these, this, uh, this, this field, let's say. I also think that the contrast in the narratives between the, the narratives about the, the, the botanical research but, and the, the exhibition of 1940 also comes from and it reveals a kind of a, a, a binary view of the world as consisting of the, the realms or the fields of nature on the one hand and human or culture on the other hand. And this binary uh, constitutes what, what some have called uh, one of the hallmarks of Western modernity and the way we in the West perceive the world and produce knowledge about the world. Uh, quite typical of our Western way of viewing nature has often been uh, that nature is, is something that is outside of our kind of human being. Uh, of our way of being human and should serve our human interests. So it's, uh, nature has often been used, for a long time has been used, especially from a Western, uh, in a Western context, for their aesthetic, for its aesthetic, uh, medicinal and commercial usages. Um, and I think that this, this binary way of viewing the world is still very much uh, uh, alive in the ways we, I mean, we divide different fields at university, for example, that you really have the sciences and the humanities, and you have really often these fields are really very much still quite separate. And I think that there's now a, a turn to kind of try to create things a bit more in a more interdisciplinary way and try to learn from, from many different fields. But I think for a long time, there have been these quite strict boundaries between the disciplines. And I think in terms of heritage practices, uh, which is my field, uh, there's also been this very strict boundary, and I think often uh, natural uh, heritage sites are very much seen as separated from cultural heritage sites. But actually, a lot of the times, there's a lot of relations between the two the two kinds of sites. Uh, in my thesis, I also argued that the dominance in Portugal of this narrative of the discoveries that I mentioned earlier uh, might also help explain some of the silences about the colonial botanical uh, histories of this garden. Narratives like uh, those about the alleged scientific prestige of the garden, some, some of the texts I showed before, the prestige of the garden that tells the story of the Portuguese in the world, reveal uh, the ongoing strength in Portugal of this kind of Eurocentric and positive narrative about the colonial past. This idea that to see the past in a quite glorifying way and often forgetting about the less positive and more violent uh, aspects of the past. And finally, I think that one factor that I think also helps explain the different types of narratives that you see in the garden today is the fact that uh, the, these efforts uh, that are quite, uh, I think uh, I think everybody is aware of them at the moment, these efforts to sort of decolonize heritage sites and museums and, and other kinds of uh, spaces are only, uh, I think only relatively recently, they started also addressing the fact that European colonialism was not only violent towards humans through slavery and other kinds of histories, but also towards nature itself. Um, see, I just a few concluding thoughts. Uh, I, I very much share the opinion of many activists and scholars in Portugal today that it's, it's urgent to address the country's colonial past in more critical ways. 
uh, it's important to show different sides of history and to share the memories of different people not just, let's say, the male navigators that went around discovering new places in the world, but also to sell, tell the stories of the colonized people and many, many other peoples that are part of history, of course. Um, it is, I think it's also important to reveal how epistemologies and practices that were developed in colonial times, like the idea of nature as something to be used for our consumption, for our pleasure, um, continue to inform ways of thinking and doing things today. I mean, I'm, I'm referring here, for instance, about the, the over-exploitation of natural resources that is a massive problem in our contemporary world. Um, I think with its historical connection to the study and extraction of natural resources in colonial contexts and to ideas uh, related to, to racial difference, cultural difference and racial difference, this garden really has a huge potential to challenge uh, problematic narratives in Portugal, what I see as problematic narratives in Portugal, like the discoveries, by revealing the darker and often silent side of these same narratives which is something which, as I showed earlier, in the act of telling about the histories of the colonial exhibition and the, the, the human zoos, let's say, it's something that is already happening very much in the garden today. And uh, finally, I think that's by, by revealing these histories and by connecting them to contemporary issues, like the environmental crisis that we are living in and social discrimination, I think that a place like this garden can really foster critical and informed reflections about our current uh, realities. I think that in doing so, this space could even encourage uh, the development of alternative, uh, more just relationships, relationships between us humans and nature, but also amongst ourselves, uh, humans. And I would like to end here with a quote from uh, uh, Sriya Satarji. Uh, she says that uh, museums and gardens must become spaces that help us learn not only about biological life and human history, but also about the colonialist and capitalist logic that still governs our contemporary, our everyday lives. Thank you. Obrigada. Well, thank you, Sophia. Some Wonderful. Some oh, what is that? Show, show. Oh, <laughs> I include some uh, some references that I, I used oh. kind of to show a bit where, where my ideas come from. Because yeah, of course, please do that. Because, you know, this seminar, I mean, there's lots of pe different people. And uh, because this will be available after we after today, Perhaps it would be nice because people can then print screen and so on. Exactly, so yeah. it's, it's nice to give. And also when uh, we finish, I don't know if I have the link. I have your thesis in PDF, but I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think I have the link. So perhaps you can give, send me the link where people can access your okay. thesis if they're interested. Would you do that? Yeah. Will you not forget? We, we will put it okay. under the description of yeah. the video. Sounds like a good idea. Wow. So thank you so much, uh, Sophia. Now we stop uh, oh. sharing screen and um, that was great. And um, yeah, let's see if people are curious, if they have questions, because first them. Oh, no, that's an, a disappointment. Now, <laughs> it, please ask questions here in the chat for Sophia and we will try to answer them all. Meanwhile, to give them time, I can say a few things about uh, the next steps, you know? Mm -hmm. So one of the things, one of the, as you said, uh, one of the things that that, that garden is fascinating, super, com super complex and super difficult, super mm -hmm. difficult uh, yeah. to address. And uh, so one of the fronts we wanted was clearly more visibility so we wanted people to enter the garden mm -hmm. and uh, so we made an effort to you know provide all sorts of mediation yeah and that will continue also because the guard the the, the buildings were super um, neglected they needed restoration especially the very old um, iron uh, architecture you know the the greenhouse mm -hmm. which is uh, there's there's not that many in Portugal so even from that point of view the perspective of uh, built heritage it's an important thing so that will be um, renovated we hope mm -hmm. the university has been doing an incredible effort in terms of investment in the garden the University of Lisbon and that mm -hmm. will uh, I hope continue there's that. We also, the, the cafe, the mm -hmm. Casa Cha will be, has been totally restored. I don't know if you 
If you saw that architect yeah. uh, Pedro Vaz, the, the architect of the Palacio de Belém, did the project and it was uh, it's totally, you know, cleaned from mm -hmm. all sorts of, you know, walls that were and restored to its um, 1940 um, architecture. And it will be a place where people can stop, have a coffee, have, uh, have, uh, sorry, the, the, let me disconnect this thing because it's bringing, bringing. And so it will be a cafe, a restaurant. Uh, the, there are also some of the warehouses that mm -hmm. materials primas will also be restored. There's a big, right. big, big project for the Palacio de Calheta, which mm -hmm. has already been approved by the Ministry of Culture, because there's also another thing is that the, the garden is as this layer of uh, heritage is classified, is listed as mm -hmm. national monument. Yeah. So there's that thing which kind of gives us some guidelines we, we need. There's not, we cannot do everything we want, which is good. Mm -hmm. Although we are very careful about what we do, but uh, who knows, uh, people may not be careful. And so there's this guidance that mm -hmm. we have. So the Palace of Calieta already has a wonderful project uh, that will have a, an exhibition where we will be able to interpret on the first floor, where we will be able to interpret the garden and also problematize and raise mm -hmm. the issues, many of the issues that you've been raising. Mm -hmm. And we still have many questions. We still have many, um, namely regarding the bus the busts. We will talk about it in a minute because I would like to actually to hear your opinion about it. I have a student doing some masters, former student, but mm -hmm. it, she's doing the, from German Germany. And she's doing some study, uh, master studies about the busts and mm -hmm. how you know they can be to go deeper into uh, the their history mm -hmm. and you know uh, their uh, because one of the things that I think that you raised and of course sometimes it's because you know these institutions they need to decolonize certainly. Mm -hmm. But um, most of the times, there's a lot of research to be made. Yeah, you know, exactly. there yeah. is it's incredible amount of research through, for example, one of the issues that you raised about where the plants, the story of the plants, you know, mm -hmm. where they came from. It's not just a species yeah. of a plant, like an archetype, abstract, <laughs> and so on. Exactly. It has a story, mm -hmm. and it has it was used by local communities by this and that and that. You know, it's, it's not that the information was not collected. It was, but it mm -hmm. was separated from yeah. the plant. You understand? Yeah. So that happened. Mm -hmm. You know, in a, you have a botanical garden, then you have the herbarium, then you have the, the collection of uh, economic botany, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. the really where, you know, you will get the <laughs> things that you can explore later, yeah. you know, from economic. So all so. this information exists, but it's dispersed. So it's huge. If you have, for example, a museum or a botanical garden with 100 years, 200 years, it's just crazy the amount yeah. of work that needs to be done. And so we encourage, we encourage, we are in the university, we encourage vividly and strongly theses like yours, studies, we are open access totally, mm -hmm. you know, of the collections, the archives. I'm sure you had a good experience with the Branca, as you said, mm -hmm. and with the, you know, the curators, Definitely, they will help yeah. you. And the more information we have, the more connections that were lost, mm -hmm. the better we can interpret, yeah. uh, the better we can interpret because it's something that we, we cannot just invent, you know, but we know the information is there, but it's been, like you say, fragmented because one thing was uh, anthropology, okay? <laughs> yeah, so the other okay. thing was mm -hmm. uh, botany. The other thing was, I don't know what, you know, so... And yeah. um, we still are struggling with um, with that kind of heritage, yeah. that yeah. kind of legacy, I should mm -hmm. say. Yeah. And so um, we're very enthusiastic about lots of people who are wanting, because also, okay, you can say it's open, but you have to have some momentum built mm -hmm. in terms of research. And your thesis was very important because now, you know, a thesis research, it opens up. Mm -hmm. because more people now will read your work and more people will be interested and will um, and will do more hopefully so we're, we're hope here so, to support yeah. everything mm -hmm. and in terms of um, the busts so um, 
what do you think should be done? Because there's this story. Of, mm. Okay, so they were in this alley, this yeah. gallery mm -hmm. of the peoples of the empire, or I don't know the name, mm -hmm. but so there was they were all together. Yeah. No. And then we don't know when. We don't know when and why and why they were dispersed the way they are now. We yeah. have absolutely no idea, but we hope to find information about it. Yeah. But, okay, so they were dispersed and now they have this configuration in the garden, probably for decoration, you know, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have several possibilities. Mm -hmm. We leave them as they are. We, we, they, we, they are already treated as objects, as museum yeah. objects. So that's, mm -hmm. a, good, that's an, okay, a step, as you said, I think mm -hmm. that uh, it's important. Yeah. Um, and they will be restored equally and, uh, and that. But there's so many possibilities. We could put them all together and mm -hmm. problematize, for example. Yeah. In Indoors. Yeah. We could leave outdoors. We could, mm -hmm. what do you think? Yeah. What is your idea about it? Yeah, I, th I think I've also been thinking about it a lot. And I think that uh, uh, leaving them in the garden as the garden is now, let's say, might not be enough in the sense that people will visit the garden. A lot of people don't read the information. They won't check the app. No, that's well, hopefully, everywhere. Hopefully, the more, you yeah. know, we want to, we, oh, you would want, I'm sure, a lot of people to read everything. But of course, that doesn't always happen. That, that never happened. No. <laughs> never happened. It's not going to happen, you know. Like, so, yeah, so, and I think that these, these representations, I mean, they show uh, stereotypical But the interpretation, yeah. but you know, uh, Sophia, mm -hmm. the interpretation is not only about labels. Labels, yeah. okay, it's even the easiest part. That's yeah. what we already did that kind of a mm -hmm. minimal information and so on. Interpretation means really update the meaning of yeah. those objects yeah, to exactly. contemporaneity. So yeah. what, in other words, problematize them. Yeah. And exactly. so that me can mean many different things. It mm -hmm. can mean um, doing an exhibition, for example. Yeah. Once you exactly. put them together, they change the, yeah. the, the, their sense, mm -hmm. their value becomes their voice becomes yeah. more salient, for example. So there's there's th things that we can do, of course. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, um, yeah. but it's not only about, you know, the, because yeah, people don't know, but we can also have guided visits. We can also yeah. have debates. We can have so many things. So yeah, I think, uh, I think an exhibition- What do you of, think? Yeah, to re-signify these objects, because I think they have a very specific meaning that was attached to them when they were made for the purpose yeah. that they were made they were made in 1944 a very specific reason to show yeah. these ethnicities yeah. and races in the colonies yeah. and yeah. this this in, in, a, in a sense i see these these statues very much as you know those photographs that were taken in these anthropological expeditions where you have people standing straight and standing in profile and people that were there their heads were yeah. measured in these kinds of horrible practices yeah, that were, yeah, 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 that were yeah. carried out and for me i see these these statues a bit in a similar way all especially considering mm -hmm. that the humans that were exhibited in the exhibition were actually also being measured and studied in this way. So these yeah. uh, uh, these 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 busts were serving a very similar function. And I think if we would put or you know we uh, if the, the you would decide to put these in an exhibition, for instance, and you would include all the busts in in one room and also show photography that was also used for the same purpose to show these peoples mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. colonies. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can also include maybe photos of the exhibition of 1940, right. where you also see yeah. the humans. And then you see- You, you kind just, of yeah, contextualize them. Yeah. yeah, you could contextualize yeah. them in the place in situ yeah. as they were done, you know, yeah. and then, um, and then uh, contextualize them, give also, yeah. you know, the intention. Because one yeah, of the things exactly, that I yeah. think that uh, Ava, Ava, my my former student, she will look mm -hmm. into is like, okay, what was the what was the instructions that were yeah. given to the author? Yeah. You know, yeah. Who gave? In principle, it should have been the the organizer of the exhibition. But mm -hmm. what were really the intention? What yeah. what did they mm -hmm. want to? It's probably there's a written even commission. Yeah. You know, yeah. okay, I commissioned these statues mm -hmm. and so on. So that should also be present because yeah. I think that will Definitely. be so poignant. Yeah. You know, yeah. that will be so poignant. The the order mm -hmm. to do those busts. Yeah, I uh, think so. And, and the, if and, I yeah, yeah. Go on, if go I'm on. not mistaken, I think I read I read an article that explained how oh this there was one author who argued that uh, 
uh, at least some of the busts have been made based on photographs that were made during anthropological yeah. expeditions. I also read that. And I also read that. Whether yeah. that is really true or not, it's it's maybe not entirely clear yeah. yet. But yeah. I think that if that is the case, then these busts could really be seen as yeah. tools to show yes. a particular kind of uh, a way of of of. Uh, objectification making, of objectifying and, and and making also this idea that you know there were the there were the portuguese the western people but then there were yeah. also the other people and those were people that because they were seen as racially inferior they were mm -hmm. it, there was justification from a sort of western colonial perspective that it was okay to colonize them and to exploit them mm -hmm. and their natural resources mm -hmm. but i think that if, if by showing the bus in relation to maybe photos and uh, and images yeah. or videos even of the exhibition of 1940 yeah. where you see yeah. But these these functions, these basically these the bus and photos and, and these exhibitions where you have human zoos, they really function. They were different media to kind of do the same thing, to right. send out a message and normalize mm -hmm. a particular mm -hmm. message yeah. of racialized yeah. of racial difference. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's right. I think an exhibition would be a great idea. An exhibition, yeah. I think an exhibition, a permanent exhibition. Yeah. You know, put them indoors. Yeah. And and just you know have them contextualized. A bit like the mu some museums did with statues that yeah. were, you know, uh, torn down yeah. and then Bristol, you know instance, put them yeah. in Bristol, for yeah. example, where mm -hmm. they collected the, the yeah. and contextualized. So this yeah. needs to be problematized and contextualized, and I think that we can do that. That we have space there to do. That would be great. Um, yeah. yeah, that will be great. And um, let's see if now people are more excited about. Uh, <laughs> no. There's, there's people watching, but they're not asking <laughs> questions. So what was the most difficult thing um, in, your, uh, in your research? What was the, was it the methodology? Was mm. it considered that, uh, uh, considering that maybe you didn't have enough or uh, solid enough, because you were actually working in a, a field that was, you know, the theoretical background mm -hmm. uh, is changing mm -hmm. and actually still changing. Yeah. And so what was the most, uh, uh, in terms of material culture, because mm -hmm. also this is a seminar of material yeah. culture. So what was the, 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 the challenges that, was it access? Was it mm. documents crossing sources, documental sources with material sources, the research, the historical research and how, yeah, I think what was partly, the most difficult thing? Yeah, I think partly because I think uh, indeed a lot of the, the texts were either, either about the exhibition of 1940 or there were some texts about the garden in terms of the, the, the botanical history, let's say, which which are quite few, as you also said, there needs to be a yeah. lot of research. So I the, think and not a yeah. lot from yeah, a historical so I, exactly. perspective. Yeah. Even recently I learned, I think it was already, I don't know, when was that? I read a text uh, by Antonio Gouveia, I think he's mm -hmm. going to publish that where I read that the director, for example, look at the complexity of this thing. <laughs> the director of the garden at mm -hmm. the time of the botanical, of the um, 1940 exhibition, mm -hmm. he was against, he opposed, no, 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 we don't want anything here because this is a botanical garden. We don't want this, uh, <laughs> this carnival of yeah. things here. So, I mean, this is complex. He thought that the plants, were for one purpose, yeah. okay? and we can also problematize that. And it was not a scenario for you know being uh, now an exhibition and so on. Mm -hmm. and so yeah. there's this, there's a lot of materials. Uh, yeah, from, very many um, perspectives, and, and and there are many many sides of the story. And I think that that yeah. is also what makes. Uh, if I go back to my, my methodology of of analyzing the narratives, I mean narratives yeah. are. It, in, in analyzing narratives, you always simplify those narratives because, of course, there are many people. If I look at the renovation project and what has been yeah. now, what, what information is presented, it comes from many yeah. different people yeah. uh, working on many different subjects. And sometimes maybe there's not a lot of communication between them. Maybe there is. No. I, I don't know exactly what goes uh, yeah. on behind. But and I guess also, yeah, that, that's and also sometimes choices need to be made and there are economic yeah. constraints. So then maybe there's not a lot of information on the on the information plate. Is it because there's no more information available or is it because there was no exactly. money to, exactly. to make a bigger You're plate? right, you're right, you're right, you're right. So that always is a bit of a struggle when I'm analyzing narratives, not to be too not to be over simplistic in those yeah. uh, in my analysis yeah. because it's I think it's quite easy to fall into that pitfall. 
of, yeah, uh, of it's simplifying. True. It's true. Then I it's create true. my own narrative that is also <laughs> that yeah, is based on yeah, other narratives, yeah. and then it becomes a. Sort and of you story. kind of actually, you are um, when you do that, it kind of superficially. Hmm. it's as if you are really reinforcing something that you actually don't want to reinforce. It's actually yeah. against, you. Yeah. yeah, I understand. I understand. It's yeah. difficult. That's right. That's and I right. think that is, I think, a very big challenge also. That was one of the things that I mentioned in my thesis, that now there are these, these information plaques next to the bus saying, these are busts that were made in 1940 for the exhibition, et cetera, et cetera. But, and that is, it's very limited information. So, okay, the bus are now contextualized. People know why and when they They're were They're not made. contextualized yet. No. They so, yeah. have label yeah. collection, labels, yeah. and label information. Yeah, so it's quite simple. Yeah. yeah. It's, quite, uh, it's quite minimal yet. It's yeah. quite minimal. And that was yeah. like one of the things I argued exactly in my thesis is that in, in, in just mentioning that information that is actually information of 1940, and that's the only thing that there is available now, is that you're kind of reproducing the same kind of logics that were used in 1940 to say, yeah. this is yeah, an exactly. Angolan woman. Exactly. That's not an Angolan exactly. woman, it's a representation exactly. and based on exactly. many different things that we are not sure of yet. Yeah. But and I'm also yeah. interested in what happened between 1940 yeah. and yesterday, not yesterday, but you know, yeah. were there issues? Were people, you know, especially in 1975, what the people who decide what are going to do with this but I'm sure there's people yeah. who has been there who has questioned these things mm -hmm. so I'm also interested in that not only I mean the story of those bus doesn't stop yeah in 1940 because that's the same thing as you know considering that this pen uh, its life cycle mm -hmm. stopped when it was made yeah mm -hmm. you know but then it has different yeah. representations <laughs> and all those yeah. layers yeah. We're interested in that, and it's quite quite difficult. Again, it goes back to research, yeah, and it goes back to interested people like you and so on. But uh, yeah. and I hope that more more researchers yeah. will come from absolutely different areas. Different field, yeah, exactly. Absolutely I think also different areas. But when mm -hmm. you mentioned that, that, that sometimes the problem or the the not the problem, the challenge of of decolonizing institutions is that there's there needs to be a lot of research. But I think that part of decolonizing institutions is also to put money and or or uh, yeah people put to in do the that agenda yeah, yeah put it in put the, agenda in the and agenda. make it a priority because it's a bit the same issue with the restitution of these of colonial objects in museums and yeah this is, but this you know Sophia, yeah. there's a hierarchy of these things you know and that's a, one of the problems there on the top there's human remains okay mm -hmm. so human yeah. remains and then you have ethnography mm -hmm. ethnography anthropology and science and especially botany, zoology, mm -hmm. uh, has not been in the agenda of the colonization yeah. itself. Yeah. As you said, of course, there are instruments, science is not neutral and so on. Mm -hmm. And of course, that all that is true. But um, scientific collections are problem, raise different issues, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. in the question of uh, decolonization. Because, mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, because when you start thinking of identity and memory, if you look at the material culture, it is much easier for an identification of memory and identity when you have an archeological artifact or mm -hmm. when you have an ethnographic yeah. artifact, which was produced mm -hmm. by this certain community. Mm -hmm. When you have a bird <laughs> or a fossil <laughs> or a plant, which is not really Angolan, Okay, mm -hmm. but it's from all over Africa, whatever. Mm -hmm. The issues of identity, which is very much related with heritage and then questions of ownership, mm -hmm. provenance, restitution, and that, all that, it, it raises different issues. And yeah. I do not see, and also I'm, I'm grateful that you did this thesis, because I do not see a lot mm -hmm. of people reflecting on uh, scientific uh, collections and mm -hmm. issues of decolonization. Okay, mm -hmm. because there is this idea, and even if you listen to lawyers who handle issues of uh, restitution, for example, I was recently in a, in a seminar organized in a different context, and um, I heard a lawyer saying, talk about looting, looting by military. Okay, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that's the kind of a hierarchy, like yeah. the top. But what about scientists? Yeah. You know? yeah, exactly. They're not, you know, yeah. what about these missions mm -hmm. that were uh, problematic and some of them, they were doing 
Um, and we have the material evidence. And yeah. So we have in museums today, we are the generation that has mm -hmm. to kind of decide or at least contribute to the decision of how those things are problematized yeah. and interpreted. It's us, it's up to us, mm -hmm. people like you, researchers, and like us, curators and so on. Uh, but um, what to do when um, uh, anthropologists were doing things, as you said, mm -hmm. that were totally out of the timeline of the mm -hmm. history of science, for mm -hmm. example, because nobody was doing that anymore. The science had progressed. Mm -hmm. Nobody was doing anthropological measurements, for example, in the 1970s but the Portuguese were, you yeah. know, and so, you know, mm -hmm. and because it was in the name of science, is it legitimate? Is it mm -hmm. more legitimate? You know, so there's yeah. different issues and I would mm -hmm. like to see more of that raised, yeah. you know, in the, in the public sphere, the public debate, the museum mm -hmm. sector, yeah. more, I would like to see more fossils, more herbarium, yeah. you know, discussed. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. not saying that it's easy, huh? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it is on the contrary. It's quite difficult. The issues of uh, memory and identity are quite complicated. Yeah. Even by the communities yeah. themselves, because they don't have the same sense of belonging, you know, mm -hmm. they don't have the same sense of belonging as they do with an objet d'art or an artifact that yeah. is used, I don't know. So it's very interesting. It's mm -hmm. fascinating. There should be much more studies into into scientific collections and issues of, of uh, uh, colo um, you mm -hmm. know uh, decolonization what we call decolonization yeah. I don't like I'm not a big fan of the term either. no because but, but no. now it's difficult because uh, what do you replace it for you know it's mm -hmm. difficult yeah. Um, yeah but yeah yeah anyway it's another challenge <laughs> another challenge but scientific so we count on you also because you have reflected this, you're already in a pole position mm -hmm. that others are not, okay? So here you have reflected about, mm -hmm. although the busts are not scientific collections, you know, they're representations, but at yeah. least you thought about the botanic yeah. uh, issue and the issue of the species, you know, mm -hmm. the neutral, because, yeah. you know, species is neutral, you know? Yeah. What is mm -hmm. not neutral is all the life cycles of the species in terms of what was used in the, uh, for for mm -hmm. um, traditional popular medicine or whatever, yeah. or how it's still used today, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and uh, that's kind of an information we need to retrieve, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And we count on you eh, to our <laughs> reflection that we have to do. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm always here for any. Uh, yeah, it's wonderful. Sharing and, uh, my thoughts. <laughs> yeah, let's see because I don't want to. Okay, no questions. So look, Sophia, it was really a pleasure to talk to you, discuss uh, all these issues. And um, yeah, and what are you going to do now? After that, are you continue to study these issues or did you change completely your uh, compass? No, I'm still very much so as, uh, my, I, as, I, as you mentioned at the beginning that I'm a program officer of uh, International Heritage Cooperation at the Cultural Heritage Agency of the yeah. Netherlands, which is kind of yeah. like the DGPC of Portugal for yeah. those who speak yeah. Portuguese in yeah. other context. Uh, but then I, I do that uh, not full time. So I still have a bit of time on the side. I'm now an independent researcher trying to apply for some grants uh, to see if I can Fantastic. also. Fantastic. Postdoc. Uh, a doc. Yeah. A doc. Yeah. First a doc. Yeah. First a doc. <laughs> yeah. First a doc. Yeah. And uh, I will be publishing an article about the botanical garden next year, but I still, I still need to write it. And it's kind of about this idea of, of displaying violence and the violence of display. Yeah. And I will also reflect a bit on these, these what, what we've been uh, discussing today. Yeah. I'll, I'll definitely share it. Uh, um, wonderful. I would love to. I look forward. But I think, yeah, I think there should be more and more. And also Holland, you know, because yeah. please. I mean, Leiden. I mean, come on. Naturalis, the collections of zoology um, yeah. everywhere, you know. All these are problematic, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some, the, In fact, the, the Netherlands was one of the first countries to repatriate their scientific the geology collections. They hmm. sent them the okay. whole thing back to Indonesia. Did you know that? No, I did not. No. To Bandung. No, I'll look into that. Yeah. Okay. Not all, but hmm. something very important, which is mm -hmm. the geological survey of Indonesia. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. so there is a, in order to do the maps, the geological maps, you need to, of course, to do probes and to collect samples and you know to mm -hmm. find out what's the epoch, the time, the geological time, yeah. and so on. 
And so, of course, you have a collection out of mm -hmm. it. And in fact, sometimes more than a geological collection, mm -hmm. our Portuguese, the Portuguese Geological Survey um, of the uh, Portugal, continental Portugal, mm -hmm. not of the colonies. I'm not sure even if it was ever done. Mm -hmm. I think the mm -hmm. cartographic survey was done, yeah. but I'm not sure about the geological survey. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some collections of uh, soils and, mm -hmm. um, and rocks from, um, from Africa, but we have inherited from ECT. So that's also right. very interesting. Yeah. That's yeah. also very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And, but, um, and so, it, but ours is in the Museo uh, the. Um, Geologic in the right. Academy of Sciences. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's where the Ge Portuguese Geological Survey is. Right. And so, but but they they also have you know archaeological because you know they do the probe and everything that comes up, <laughs> they keep, uh, yeah. artifacts, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Listed gets listed and it mm -hmm. gets in the collection. So the Dutch had the Geological Survey of mm -hmm. uh, Indonesia and they gave everything back in uh, I think 1992. Okay. No, maybe later. Maybe later. Hmm. Uh, I can send you more information about yeah, that. Yeah, that would be interesting to read. And yeah. completely without any, you know, it was much before, and that proves a little mm -hmm. bit the point. These museums didn't wake up to this thing like yesterday. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this yeah, has been happening, definitely. especially with human remains, but also when things make sense. Mm -hmm. For the Dutch, it made sense that the geological survey mm -hmm. of Indonesia <laughs> should be in Indonesia. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. You know? So... Uh, so they did that long before everything was um, was uh, even discussed. Mm -hmm. I can send you one or two papers about it. Yeah, please do. Uh, yeah. It was at the University of, I think, Amsterdam, precisely. Okay. Hmm. At the University of Amsterdam. Uh, but anyway, I don't know why I started saying this thing. It had to be connected. Oh, yeah, because of, I don't know, I mm -hmm. don't know. But anyway, <laughs> just to put in context uh, that... Um, yeah, there's so much to do, basically. It's yeah. overwhelming what we have yeah. to do. True. And there's, well, very limited financial resources, not just in Portugal, yeah. I mean, also in the Netherlands, I think. There's, Everywhere. There's too much work Everywhere. and too little people. Well, not maybe not yeah. too little people, but too little money to do the Yeah, research. because people have absolutely no idea hmm. uh, of the time and yeah. the, you know, the type of expertise, which should be absolutely high quality to do mm -hmm. this kind of provenance research. Mm -hmm. It's just incredible. It's super difficult. You have to cross multiple documents. Yeah. You have to go, eventually you even have, because then things disappear, they got dispersed. You have to mm -hmm. find out, and it's very difficult to find them. And you have to be critical about it because one thing is something that was written uh, during the period. Another thing is something that was written 20 years ago in a yeah. newspaper. So this, you know, yeah. analyzing sources. And so you need historians for that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and uh, and historians are not in museums. So, but that's another problem. So that is a kind of external <laughs> problem to this. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's this challenges, but we have to go. I mean, what I say is that we deal with eternity. So we're here, we're going to stay here. We need to identify the really complicated issues and mm -hmm. go from there. Yeah. You know, so, okay, so you have this, you have that, you have that. The busts are clearly mm -hmm. one of the things that we need, but there are more. There's like mm -hmm. at least <laughs> at least of 20, 20 things. Yeah. But, and then we have to go from there. Mm -hmm. And with scholarship, with uh, interdisciplinarity, with yeah. the, uh, the co-curation, so to speak, of the communities, of yeah. present, uh, present day communities. Definitely, yeah. And uh, if possible, even communities of the countries of origin, not yeah. only the ones that are dislocated here in Portugal, mm -hmm. so but work directly yeah, with exactly. museums there and so on. So yeah, it, uh, yeah. yeah it's abs it's vital. Yeah. It's vital. Mm -hmm. Even if we were only thinking about knowledge and information, it's absolutely mm -hmm. vital. Definitely. We have to work with them because it's a mm -hmm. shared at the minimum, yeah. at the very minimum, it's a shared heritage, right? Mm -hmm. It's 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 not ours. It's no. not ours. No. <laughs> yeah. That's a good way of putting it, I think. Yeah, it's not ours. Mm. It's not ours. Definitely. Okay, Sophia. So it's uh, it has been a pleasure to meet you and to talk to you. And um, 
Yeah, and I wish you all the best. And next time you come, I hope we can have a coffee somewhere. That would be nice. Yeah. And talk more. And um, and yeah, I, that's it. It's, we're going to close this seminar for today. Okay. Let me just give another last <laughs> minute opportunity because no, there's no. <laughs> but there could be. If there are any questions mm -hmm. that this, uh, as always, you know, mm -hmm. you can leave them in the comments and mm -hmm. then we will forward them to Sophia and Sophia will be delighted, I'm sure, to answer them. And as for us, we will meet again next, um, what are we, June? Is mm -hmm. it June? Yeah, June, yeah, it's June. <laughs> so we're going to meet in the last uh, Monday of July, also with the Tropical Botanical Garden, actually, but with um, a study done by a master's student of the Faculty of Sciences who develops a 3D hmm. app. So it's something that you can navigate in between oh. the, all the everything, all the, which is also nice. The more, it's again research, different Definitely. perspective, yeah. but research. And so she will be here, Susanna, uh, next month. As for you, Sophia, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it was